one thing I, I want to talk to you guys about was um, if she, she did jump off the bridge, what are the odds that she's not somewhere all the way out in the ocean by now? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Something we speak about often on this channel is betrayal. This case is another example of a betrayal of the worst kind. Childhood friends, prom dates, some of the most trusted people in a young woman's life, turning on her mindlessly, ruthlessly, for purely selfish reasons. This is the truly tragic case of Sarah Stern. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with at least two new videos every week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Sarah. Sarah Stern was born on the 24th of March 1997 in Neptune City, New Jersey, USA. Her parents, Carla and Michael, encouraged her to be creative and active growing up. Mother Carla owned a bookstore and was a member of the American Booksellers Association. She had a real entrepreneurial spirit. Father Michael worked in quality control and project management. Sarah grew to have an artistic flair. She based much of her work around various fandoms, sharing her work on Twitter, and even giving it to the stars of her favourite shows and podcasts in person. The family enjoyed vacations together and were big fans of visiting Disney World. However, sadly in 2013, Carla passed away after a battle with cancer. Not the easiest start in life. But Sarah kept a positive attitude and threw herself into her passions. Now December the 3rd, 2016, Sarah was 19 years old. It's not an emergency. Um, actually on the Belmar Bridge, right after heading south in the middle of the bridge, there's a car that's abandoned. An Uber driver was travelling along Belmar's Shark River at around 2.45am when he spotted a car abandoned on the road. The driver had a gut feeling about this relatively normal site. It was parked at the top of the Route 35 bridge that connected Belmar with Avon-by-the-Sea, New Jersey. He realised something wasn't right and called the police. The 1994 silver Oldsmobile 88 with four doors was parked in an unusual fashion. The car's keys were still in the ignition when police arrived, but there was no trace of anyone inside or close to the vehicle. The car was in good condition. It both started and ran smoothly. Police believe there could be two main reasons why the car would be there. Firstly, it could be stolen and dumped. Or secondly, and more concerning, the driver could be in crisis. When they tracked the vehicle back to 96-year-old Lillian Stern, they learned that her 19-year-old granddaughter, Sarah Stern, frequently used it. Given that Sarah's car was parked on a bridge with a view of the Shark River, police needed to find out where she was immediately. Had she fallen or jumped into the water? Was she in trouble or had she already drowned? Time was working against them. Michael, Sarah's father, admitted to the police that he had been attempting to reach Sarah all night. He had sent her many text messages, but got no response. He was unaware of where she was or what she was doing. Unfortunately, at the time, he was over 1,000 miles away on vacation in Florida. Police needed to quickly build a profile of who Sarah was and what state of mind she was in that day. Liam McAtasney had known Sarah for around 13 years. They met at just six years old at Sunday school and had been good friends ever since. At around 4am, Liam was visited at home by the police. You Liam? You got a second? Can I come in and talk to you real quick? Yeah, no problem, officer. Is uh, Sarah here by chance? No. When was the last time you talked to her? I was with her today. What time? Uh, before I went to work. So it was earlier today? Yeah. When was the last time you had any kind of contact at all with her? Um, turn some light on if you don't mind. I mean, we went to get food today. And you went to work over time? Uh, 4.30. Okay, so you haven't talked to her since 4.30? Do you no. have a cell phone you can reach out to it, to her on? I actually haven't been able to find my cell phone. Any idea where it's at? I've been all day. What's her, what was her mindset last time you talked to her? I just know she's been trying to get away. 
up and tell me she's going to Canada. Trying to get away, okay. Canada, she's been real depressed lately? Her dad is crazy. Okay, and then she's dealing with the loss of her mother. Her dad's in yeah. Florida right now, right? Her dad, yeah. He's coming back today, I guess. I don't know what time it is. Where's the grandma? You? Grandma's actually sick. Where's she's, your grandma at right now? She's not at the house. She's staying with, him, with some family member. Okay. Grandma's coming home right now. She's at uh, Sharon's. Are they going to be able to get into the house? Because I know that they're I not. We can get into the there house. There isn't a key. We can get I into the house. Okay. The house was open earlier. We were already in the house. And I have a key to the house. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Keep looking for your phone to see if there's any yeah. messages or anything. All right? Thank you. And all this, these yeah, things well, these things sitting around here? Let us know. All right. Call us up. Yeah, let us know. Yeah, that's sorry about That's questionable behavior, man. If yeah. you can uh, <laughs> if you can maybe reach out to some friends, maybe hit our message on yeah. social media. I definitely will. Start reaching out to somebody, see if anybody's talked to her or yeah. if they when they talked to her, what her mindset was. He claimed that Sarah had recently become quite depressed. He painted a picture of a young woman at the end of her tether, someone seeking a new life and a way out. He said that she was packing up her belongings to leave and relocate to Canada. Canada, and Toronto in particular, is somewhere that Sarah had previously visited. She had tweeted about her excitement surrounding the country several times. Liam also claimed that Sarah's father, Michael, was unstable. Police discovered that Sarah was an only child, and that her mother sadly passed away in 2013. Liam used this information to build a picture of Sarah, saying she was likely to attempt to take her own life. This raised concerns because the location of the car suggested that she may have jumped off the bridge into Shark River. If she had done this, she would almost certainly have been carried down river into the Atlantic Ocean. Police searched Shark River and the surrounding land, but no evidence of her whereabouts was discovered. There was a breakthrough with the discovery of a CCTV camera located under the Route 35 bridge. This could have revealed if Sarah did indeed end up in the water. But frustratingly, and typically in these type of cases, it had not been functional in quite some time. Liam was now interviewed by the police once more. They sought to determine Sarah's exact mental state, and whether this was likely a case of her taking her own life. What's going on? Just give me what's going on with her. Like, how's she been acting lately? Um, the same, different. No. Liam, you've known her for since first grade. You said. Yeah. Has she has she been different than normal lately? Well. And for how long? In the past, she has had a tendency to have self-destructive behavior. Over the past few months, she's been telling me. Excuse me. How. Uh, Bad her relationship with her father is and how she just needs to get out of here why was it bad what made it bad fighting arguing fighting arguing, fighting I've I've been friends with her since first grade so we have a pretty good friendship Liam was not just a close friend of 13 years. Police also thought that he was one of the last people to see her after they met for lunch on December the 2nd. They went to Taco Bell together that day, ate, and then returned to her place. Sarah was last seen by Liam when he left for work that afternoon, according to him. A surveillance camera owned by Sarah Stern's neighbour captured Liam leaving the home in the late afternoon. This indeed matched what Liam told the police. In order to get to work, he said he left her home in the afternoon. The camera captured Sarah's car backing out of the driveway later that evening at 11.45pm. However, unfortunately, the police were not able to see the car's driver. When the car was spotted again on the bridge by the Uber driver, Sarah had vanished. What's the extent of your relationship? Uh, I would say we're pretty close friends. More, more over the summer than during the winter, but we've still been pretty close. She actually, uh, I'm a lifeguard in Bradley Beach. She was a bad chick, so I saw her pretty much every day over the summer. We're just childhood friends, we can talk about whatever. Do you know her family? Yeah, I know she's with her family. You know her dad? Mm hmm What's your relationship like with her dad? Not good. When you say not good, what do you mean? I, I can't say that anything's ever gotten violent, but I know that there's a lot of fighting all the time. It's constant fighting between her and her father. We, you haven't told us uh, about the bank. Yeah. How come you haven't told us about the bank? Well, I told him about 
the bank. But did you go to the bank? I was with her. Okay, that's the way back from Taco Bell. What did you do with the bank? No idea. I didn't go in. You stayed in the car? Yeah. What did she tell you she was stopping at the bank? Something to do with her money. I don't know. She had found money in that one house a few months ago. And uh, you know, she has a lockbox full of money in there. A lockbox full of money where? In Carney Bank. How do you know? She's told me. Whose money did she find? She said that it must have belonged to her mother. What she thought was her mom left it for her, hid it in the house. So if her dad were to uh, take her money, she would still have money left for her by her mom. That's how much money? I couldn't tell you. She said it could be, she told me a range. She said it could be from 20 grand to 100 grand. She wasn't sure. She wasn't sure how much money she found? Yeah. How, does that make sense to you, that you wouldn't be sure how much money you found? Well, she told me the condition of the money was pretty bad. Like it was all stuck together. Well, it was all old, old bills. Did she give you any of the money? No. Just I do know that Robert Santamon is another person that knows about the money besides me, though. Because she had told me that uh, he needed to get something done with his car and he was asking her for money. But that's the only person I know that would have an idea of how much money it would be. Some thought that Sarah drove to Shark River, shot herself and fell into the water. Others who knew Sarah better didn't think she would have harmed herself in this way or that she would have just upped and left for Canada or elsewhere. Most people that knew her wouldn't describe her as melancholy or depressed. They thought of her as happy-go-lucky and full of life. Furthermore, they were aware that she would have brought her cherished dog, Buddy, with her everywhere she went. There's no way that she would have left him home alone with no plans in place to care for him. However, when they searched Sarah's home, Buddy was discovered locked up in his cage. He had no food or water. This surely isn't something Sarah would have allowed to happen. Buddy and Sarah were the best of friends. Despite extensive searches by the police and local residents, Sarah wasn't found, nor was any evidence discovered to point towards if she had ended up in the water. The search for Sarah was eventually abandoned. It was starting to seem as though Sarah's disappearance would never be solved. When Anthony Curry, an amateur filmmaker, got in touch with the police in January 2017, everything they thought they knew about Sarah's disappearance changed in an instant. Though he wasn't certain, he thought he may have known what happened to Sarah. He felt compelled to inform the police about a story that Liam had told him because it was stuck in his mind. It just didn't sit right with him. On Thanksgiving night, around a week before Sarah vanished, Liam revealed a fantasy to Anthony. In this twisted fantasy, he would take the life of a female. He wanted to throttle them and then throw them from a bridge. He informed Anthony that it was merely just a plot for a movie, something he was working on. But Anthony later feared the worst when he learned that Sarah was missing. The parallels were startling. Anthony helped the police with their investigation, and on January the 31st, 2017, he consented to record Liam via a hidden camera. It wasn't difficult to obtain a confession. Liam was disturbingly eager to speak with Anthony. He couldn't wait to explain what had occurred to Sarah in great detail. He spoke about how she passed, how she repeatedly called his name, begging him to stop. Here is that recording. I pretty much hung her, like, I just, I picked her up and had her just, like, dangling off the ground, and she just f***ed herself, and oh, yeah, you lose control of your said balance. my name, and then that was it. And it took me a half an hour to kill her. I thought I was going to be able to choke her out and have her out in, like, a couple minutes. I choked her out, and then she was just laying there having a seizure or something. So then I just... I had to, I got a shirt and I just shoved it down her throat so she wouldn't throw up or anything and held my finger over her nose and set a timer. That's the only time I had my phone. And it took me like a half an hour after I hit start. 
Only time. He revealed to Anthony that he dumped Sarah's body off the bridge with the aid of an acquaintance, Preston Taylor. Preston Taylor was Sarah Stan's prom date just the year before, although they didn't date or have an intimate relationship. Police detained Preston and Liam the next day. So, how long have you known Liam for? His family was probably after me and Liam. Liam was within my husband class freshman year, so I've known him since then. Actually, we're pretty good friends. I know you and I were just beginning of high school. Yeah. Did you go to school with Sarah as well? Yeah, they were all in the same friend group. That was essentially who I started hanging out with when I went to high school. Now, is she your year or is she older or younger than you? She's the same age. Same age. You guys graduated together. Um, how did you meet Sarah? Through Liam and Stamets. They're friends with like a whole bunch of Nets and City kids. And that's what I started hanging out with. Um, and did you help? Did, like, did you socialize with Sarah? Did you talk to her on a regular basis? Or? Not on a regular basis. When we hung out, like when everyone all got together and talked to her, that was really a, Did you talk to her on the phone? Do you have her phone number? Like, do you have that type of relationship with her where, like, you can call her up? But, because we didn't really too much. Sarah had been close friends with both Liam and Preston. To many, it was unthinkable that they would have been involved in their disappearance in any way. The two beachfront communities of Belmar and Avon-by-the-Sea were thrown into disbelief. As stated earlier, Preston had only taken Sarah to the prom the year before, but according to Liam's tape confession, the motive in this crime was not for either man. The main driving force behind this vile attack was simply money. Liam had been preparing an attack on Sarah for six months. Sarah possessed, in Liam's estimation, about $100,000. Whilst Liam was devising a scheme to rob her, Sarah believed that she was spending time with a good friend, confiding in him, and making plans. She had known him since first grade, after all. The trust was deep set. He was aware that she had received some money after her mother passed away, but Sarah's finances were in no way comparable to his six-figure delusions. The worst part of it is, I thought I was walking out 50 grand, 100 grand in my pocket. She had one safe, and she took money out, and she only had 10 grand. And this money... I don't know if it was Bert or something. It's f***ing old money, terrible quality. I don't even know if I can put any of it in the f***ing bank. In reality, there was less than $10,000 involved. That was the price of Sarah's life. It's your life, you might as well make it one. <laughs> what, are you going to live some boring ass life? Given that they still lacked the vital evidence of Sarah's body, police realised that they would need more than a tape confession to build a strong case for the prosecution. Luckily, they got just what they needed. Preston admitted to his role in the crime and told the police everything. He even walked the police through the house where the attack happened. When I entered... When you entered, were the lights on in the house or were they off? The lights back here were off, but the kitchen and the living room lights were on. Okay. And this door was closed. This one I couldn't get open, but I was able to push this one open, enter, and Sarah was slumped in this corner right here. Okay. Um, and again, behind um, this door. Preston, you said now there's these two bifold doors here. The door to the left was in what position? It was closed. Okay. And did you try to open it? I tried to, was only able to get it about that far and realized that she was behind the door. Okay, and how about the right door? Were you able to open that fully? Yes. Okay, and uh, where? how was Sarah's body positioned in this bathroom? She was sitting like this, tucked into the corner and leaning over the toilet. Okay, and her feet were where? Sticking out into the room. Position when you were taking her out? She was been facing away and I had my arms under her shoulders like this. Okay. Uh, so were her feet dragging on the, on the ground? Yeah. Okay. And then I carried her over here.
dragged her over here and kind of sat her under the bushes right here. These are the bushes that you place Sarah in? Mm-hmm. Okay, and yes. how, did, how did you position her when you brought her out here? She was laying on her side like this. Okay, which direction was her face? Facing okay. outward. Okay. And with her feet down here and her head up here. Okay, so her head was up here and, and her face was facing Detective Catalana? Yeah. Okay. And what, what type of position was she in? Was she, um, was she laying on her side? Was she laying flat? Was she laying on her stomach with her head turned? She was laying on her left side. Okay. Two of us hopped the fence right here again. And we made our way up to the house right under these bushes here. We pulled her out. And he picked her up to start dragging her. I grabbed her legs and got her over to the fence. Okay. Liam dragged her over to the car and sat her in the passenger seat while I was putting the safe in my car. Okay. And did you see him dragging her? Yeah. Um, if somebody were driving down the road and looking into that car, what would they what would they see? They would have seen Liam driving a car and Sarah assuming that she was asleep asleep in the passenger seat. Okay, and you traveled to which bridge? The 35 bridge to Belmar going southbound. Okay. We're saying Liam had her. Liam had her by the shoulders and hoisted her up onto the railing. And then I pushed her feet over so that she was going over the rest of the way. As she went over immediately after, her body was up and over the rail. As we were running back to my car, the black uh, Mercury Mystique, we heard a uh, loud metallic bang. And that was all. Okay. Did you um, have any conversation with Liam about that noise that you heard? No. Okay. Liam now remained silent and would not respond to any of the police's questions. Perhaps he realised that bragging about what he had done wasn't working in his favour. Preston, however, admitted to dumping Sarah's body over the Route 35 bridge. He admitted to robbery planning the robbery, tampering with physical evidence, and two counts of obstructing an investigation. Preston agreed to give testimony against his friend, Liam. He named Liam as the mastermind behind the plot to take out Sarah. Liam was charged with murder, felony murder, robbery, conspiring to commit robbery, delaying arrest, tampering with evidence, and disturbing human remains. He entered a not guilty plea. At Liam's trial, Sarah's body had still not been located, but the evidence against him was compelling. The recorded confession allowed Liam to tell the story of the murder itself, the reason for it, and its consequences, all whilst the jury watched on. It's good, man. What's up, man? How you doing? How you doing? You want a cigarette? Nah, I'm good. I quit them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was smoking. A lot of cigarettes while I was tripping. Really? Yeah. I tripped for like a whole, like two months straight. <laughs> what were you doing? <sighs> Sitting around. <laughs> what you been up to? Hiding from the cops. What's, what happened? Dude, you can't blame me for doing this, right? I gotta feel you up real, real quick, all right? You're good. No disrespect. I'll show you. No disrespect, okay? Nothing. Yeah, I got the FBI on my ass, dude. All right, so I'm hanging out with her. She has, we, we went to the bank. She took some money out, not all of her money. We're counting it out, and then she goes to walk out the front door. I choke her out, drag her. I choke her out, drag her into the back, put her in a bathroom. And then I had to go straight to work. So mm -hmm. Preston came over, took the body, put it in the bushes. So I have to leave. I f***ing dropped my phone at Sarah's house. My phone was at Sarah's house. Like... Wait, like, you left your phone? Yeah, I lost it. I couldn't find it. I had to go to work. I had timed everything out so what that... What did you, why did you take your phone? You should have left it in your f***ing pocket. Dude. What were you doing? Strangling someone? I couldn't find it, dude. It ended up being out in the driveway. And then 
I was at work. I had a full like night of work, except I left work a couple times, which looks sketchy. Right. Look for my phone though, right. which is a reasonable like thing to do. Yeah, you gotta look for your phone. Yeah, you can't which is, is kind of like me losing my phone was kind of a good thing because the cops are like, oh, he's hanging out with her. He lost her phone. His phone. He's going back and forth between his house looking for it. Right. And then I get off work that night, go straight over, Preston and I go over to her house, take her safe. I had planned Sarah's situation for me to be interrogated by cops. Right. Like, that was the whole part of my plan, to make me look not guilty. What like, did you, what, did you end up throwing up? Like, you didn't hear about it? It was all over the news. Right, but I didn't know if you, like, went through it. Yeah. And the worst part is... We threw her off the bridge, and the body never showed up. It's, it's probably frozen. It's probably all the way out in the ocean. And it's frozen, so she's not coming up anytime soon. She, everybody's probably at the bottom of the ocean, or she got eaten by a shark or something. Yeah. Bro, this is like a movie, bro. And then Preston and I had these walkie-talkies to communicate with. We just used them again. And then Preston comes over the bridge, goes around, makes it a U-turn comes up behind me. The two of us throw the body over, and then we we're out. Bro, it was good seeing you, bro. Yeah. When I come back down, I'll let's fucking do something. Be, be, it's listen. Look at me. Be safe, all right. Yeah. Don't do any fucking stupid. Listen, I'm not gonna let Preston do anything dumb. I did something really dumb, and I planned it out for half a year. I I have patience. I got it. It's good talking to you, bro. Good talking. Take it easy, bro. Safe travels, all right? You too. You got everything? Yeah. All right, peace out. His propensity to brag pretty much sealed his fate. Additionally, they heard from Preston, who told the court his story. Was there a point in time in 2016 where you learned something about Sarah Stern and, and her coming into something? Yeah, I uh, learned that she found a shoebox full of money at house Did you ask any questions about that money when you first learned about it? I asked how much it was, and I was told that it was in the range of about $100,000. After first learning about that box of money or that money, $100,000, whatever it was, did that, did that money ever come up on previous or prior or occasions in the, in the future? It did. Okay. And how did that happen? What types of conversations did you have about it? Well, at first we started discussing the fact that it was a lot of money and what we would do if we had that type of money. And then the conversation evolved into, well, what if we did have that type of money, specifically her money? And that was when the idea to rob her came about. Okay. Now, the first time he told you about Sarah's money, where were you? We're at our house, okay. Latin Island Street. When was the next specific conversation where that money was brought up? At uh, Clancy's Tavern, where I worked. Okay. I was, uh, it was towards the end of a shift. Things were slowing down. William came in with uh, another friend, Sean McMahon and Billy McAvoy. And he brought up the money, passed the comment that it was the type of money that somebody would kill for. Liam claimed that Anthony's tape of him speaking was him simply talking about a movie's plot, something he was sharing with Anthony because he was a filmmaker. He also asserted that Preston was just a liar and that he was in fact innocent, but his lies didn't work. Liam was given a life sentence without parole after being found guilty on each of his seven charges. For the desecration of Sarah's remains, he received an additional 10 year sentence. As the judge noted in court, Preston did everything but wrap his hands around Sarah's neck, even though he did not personally murder her. He was fully aware of the situation put forward by Liam, but decided willingly to betray his prom date. He could have put a stop to it at any time, gone to the police, intervened personally, warned Sarah, but he chose money over human life. However, Preston Taylor, in contrast to Liam, apparently expressed regret for his actions, saying, There's so many things about this scenario I wish I could take back and make right. I should have known better and done something to stop this, and I wish more than anything I had. I'm sorry. 
Preston Taylor was sentenced to a prison term of 20 years. Father Michael left the court as Preston spoke. Preston's words didn't change what he had done. He simply wasn't interested in hearing any justifications, defences or regrets. None of this would bring Sarah back. Michael remarked, I was devastated and numb from shock the day I learned from detectives Sarah was murdered. I've had horrific dreams and nightmares. The horrid act of what happened to her body haunts me every day. I will never be able to hug Sarah again. Sarah has never been found and in reality she never will be. Sadly lost at sea. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? Let me know down in the comments. Join the Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications for at least two new videos every week. Like the video to boost the signal of this case. Thank you to all my patrons. Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palmieri, James Harrington. Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Krogerus, Summer Chambers, and Mona Corona. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.